decade called the Roaring Twenties, and it's called the Roaring Twenties for a lot of reasons. This is a lecture for my seventh hour class on the 10th of May. It's called the Roaring Twenties for, for a lot of reasons. A lot of things change. Number one, the progressive era came to an end. You need to make sure you have that down. For 20 years, from 1900, from Teddy Roosevelt to Woodrow Wilson, uh, we had lived in the progressive era. Progressive liberal era. We had three progressive presidents. Two were Republicans, and one was a Democrat. One was a Democrat. But the fact is, is, socially and philosophically, I think they were almost the same. They were liberals. Now the American people enter the 1920s feeling like we got tricked into this war. We never should have fought it. Uh, we've had this god awful pandemic, the Spanish flu. Uh, morals are changing. Uh, clothing styles are changing, music is changing, everything in America is changing, uh, and there is this great fear, get this down, the great fear uh, is, is uh, sweeping across America, and it is a fear of communism, write that down. And this comes right out of World War I, it's called the Great Red Scare, Americans fear that the communists are on the march, after all, right in the middle of World War I, they had taken over the largest country in the world, right? Uh, they had, Lenin had made uh, the Russia into the Soviet Union. Uh, Karl Marx, 50 years before that, had predicted in his book, uh, Das Kapital and the Communist Manifesto, that one day the communists would rule the world. And they said, this is the beginning of this. The Russian Revolution is the beginning. And so Americans are afraid that communists are going to take over America. And so this kicks off the first great red scare. As I said earlier through the class, if there's a first great red scare, you know there's going to be a second great red scare after World War II. But this is after World War I. And get this down. The purpose of the red scare, get this down, is to identify communists, find out where the communists are, and get rid of them. Put them in jail, export them, throw them out the country, but get rid of, this con get rid of these communists before they start a war uh, here. In, uh, excuse me, started a revolution here in the United States and destroyed the country. So there is a fear of communists. Uh, get this down. There is a fear of immigrants. Write this word down. Xenophobia. That means a fear of all things foreign, including immigrants. Okay? A fear... Oops. A fear of immigrants. All things, all things foreign. And for the first, to get all this down, for the first time in our history, we restrict immigration. Look, from 1789, the year we became a country, until 1924, people came to this country all the time, documented and undocumented. People came to the United States from all over the world. For the first time in our history, we restrict that. For the first time in our history, we say no more immigrants. For a while, anyway. No more immigrants. Because we are fearful that all of these immigrants entering America, some of them may be communists, some of them may be anarchists, some of them may be coming here to start a Russian revolution right here in the United States, and they said we're not going to stand for it. Also get this down, we're talking about the beginning of the 1920s. Also get this down, there are strikes everywhere. Why are there so many strikes in America in the, once the war is over? Why are workers out marching for higher wages and all that? Why at this particular moment in history they did? Because they're paying for the soldiers and all that, and their wages got cut down. What? Because they're paying for the, the last part of that. Maybe their wages true. got cut down because of the. Wars. What happened to workers' wages when the war broke out? The they they took control. control. They, away. they said they said no more what? No more raises. No more raises. So they had not raised in a couple of years. Get this down. They say now we want what we got coming to us. So when you picked up a newspaper, and by the way, there is no radio at this point. There is no television at this point. You're still getting your news from the radio. Excuse me, the uh, newspapers, there is no radio. And when you picked up your newspaper over your morning coffee in fall of Oklahoma, almost every major big city in the United States, there was a strike going on. And sometimes they couldn't get the newspapers delivered because the newspapers had gone on strike. And some you couldn't catch a bus because the bus drivers had gone on strike. And there's going to be a famous one we're going to talk about in a moment, where in a major U.S. city, all the policemen didn't show up to work. What would happen to Tulsa? What would be going on in Tulsa right now, if this morning, none of the policemen had gone to work? It'd be what? There'd no, be a crime spree. There would be a crime spree. That's a great way to put it. Criminals would take it over. People would be assaulted. Banks would be robbed. 
jewelry stores, people would walk in and literally sweep off uh, everything there, all the diamond rings and watches, and, and there would be no one to stop them if all the police didn't go to work today. Well, that's going to happen. Uh, it actually happens before the 20s. It happens in 1919, but it's close enough. But we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. It's close enough for the 1920s. So all of this is going on. Get this down. There's a bombing campaign. The socialists and the communists, they start sending bombs to the justices of the Supreme Court, to the Attorney General of the United States. They send it to Wall Street, the heart of capitalism. And when you read about that in your paper, you know, what would we, let me just ask you this, what would we think today, right now, if over the intercom they came over and they said, uh, you know, a bomb just went off at the Chase Manhattan Bank in New York City and killed 50 people. What would be the first word to come in our mind? Terrorists. Terrorists. That's exactly because we live in the age of, what were these people living in the age of? Communism. What did they think? Communism. And by the way, this is going on in big cities. Where did Lenin start his revolution? He didn't start it out on the farm. Where did he start it? In the big cities. They said, this is the beginning of the communist revolution, and we've got to stop it. So one of the attributes of the 20s is there's great fear. And then speaking of great, write this down. There's a great migration that begins in the 1920s. Get this down. There's a great migration. African Americans, get this down. African Americans living in the South, you know, you with me? Yeah, living in the South for years. They had been tortured, murdered by the Klan, lynched. And now they say, we're going to go north. We're going to leave. We're going to go to Michigan and Ohio uh, and uh, Wisconsin. We're going to go to the northern states. And they were hoping that the racial prejudice wouldn't be as strong there. And when they get to the north, they discover that it is, okay? But they move to cities like Chicago and, and Detroit. And whites in those cities resent that. Uh, and in fact, in Detroit, in De excuse me, not Detroit, in Chicago, you know, Chicago sits at the southern end of Lake Superior. And Lake Superior, well, it's not quite, it's a little rounder than that. But here sits Chicago. And one of the main attractions of that city are the beautiful beaches out there, beautiful, pristine beaches. People go out there and tan and sun and swim and, you know, uh, you know, do all sorts of things out on uh, out on the beach. Well, in those days, the beach was segregated. When they get up there, that beach is segregated. Now, they didn't literally have a line there, but everybody knew. This is the white section of Lake Superior. This is the, can you imagine, segregating the Great Lakes? Boy, that's real. That's pure racism. And there was a 19, well, 17-year-old black teenager. I'll think of his name in a minute. But there was a 17-year-old black teenager, and he was over here with his friends on a summer day in Chicago, and they were swimming and splashing around like people do. Uh, and uh, he wasn't paying close attention, and I don't know if he went to chase a ball or he went, what he did, but he drifted over to the white section uh, of the beach. And whites on, on the beach saw that, and there's just there's this great roar, and they – ran and they collected stones and they stoned him to death, okay? They threw stones that he was desperately trying. But then he realized I'm in the wrong section of the Great Lakes with me, and he's trying to swim back over to the, quote, black section, and they stoned him to death and killed him. And when that happened, get this down, a great riot broke out in Chicago. It lasted eight days, and 50 people were killed. 50 people were killed in the Chicago riots. Of the, I think that was in 1921, 1921. So if you were not a native-born white American, uh, you might have problems in America in the 1920s. Get this down. The 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan is reborn, okay? When the 1920s started, there might have only been 5,000 people in the Klan. By the way, how many, the Klan's still around. How many do you reckon, are, how many people do you reckon are in the Klan today in the United States? And, uh, uh, what? How many would you suspect? 50,000. 50, 50,000? What'd you say? 15. 15. Well, you're close. About 10,000. By the way, they call themselves by different names. They've got their own website, the Aryan Nation, but it's the Ku Klux Klan. And they've got other names, too. Uh, the Ku Klux, and there's one called the Proud Boys. They're pretty clannish, okay? Ku Klux Klannish. Uh, uh, and uh, anyway, yeah, uh, they're still around. It's a territory. And by the way, they still kill people. You know, uh, if there were ten, if we, if we discovered there were ten thousand members of Al Qaeda living in the United States, this country would be in an uproar. But I guess we've learned to live with the Ku Klux Klan. I think. Anyway, there were about five thousand of them when the twenties began, but there's so much change and things are so unsettled 
And people are so fearful in the 1920s, get this down, that Klan membership is going to grow. What do you think? By the way, get this down. The 1920s, that's the greatest period uh, of Klan membership in the history of the United States. More people were in the Klan. Not the 1820s. Not, not the 1860s. I'm talking about the 1920s. That's the greatest period of Klan membership in the history of the United States. How many of you think it, there, there were? Just guess. 300,000. 300, 5 million. Oh right. my. 5 million of the Ku Klux Klan. By the way, which state, which state had the most Klan members in it? Michigan. Nope. Oklahoma. That's a good guess. Oklahoma's pretty much, it's not Oklahoma, but we're pretty much a Klan state. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you. In the 1920s, over in the state legislature, the Ku Klux Klan probably had a majority of the members in the Oklahoma state legislature. But it's not Oklahoma, it's not Alabama. Louisiana. Texas, Kansas. Louisiana. What? Kansas. Texas. Kansas. No. Mississippi, Texas. No. Mississippi's a good guess. Arkansas? Indiana. Oh. Now, what's unusual about that? It's the north. It's just it's the north. It's a northern state. Okay? And you wouldn't think that. But guess what? Uh, that, that, I'm illustrating the point. The Klan's all over. It's a nationwide thing. It's no longer in the south. It's just in the South. It's a nationwide thing in the 1920s. There are so many of them, and I've got these out of order, but there are so many clans. But look at this. There's some clan chicks. Period. Oh. I, I feel sorry for that horse. You know, the horse is in clan ropes. I don't think he had any choice to join, I guess. He said, you know, put your hoof footprint here. Horse. But look, you know, he's a. But that's the Klan always says. They, they carry two things, the Bible and the American flag. Okay, if there's anything antithetical to both those, it's the Ku Klux Klan. What's that? What are they doing? Bernie 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 huh? Bernie yeah, but one of those guys all didn't even have there. The print. Oh, somebody lost the contact. No, you're right. They're, they're taking the oath. You take the oath and you have to kneel down. So they're all kneeling down, and you're right, they're burning the cross. So they just did that at random night? What? Why did they burn the cross? To illuminate it, to make it more uh, visible, okay? Uh, they say that's honoring, you know, to light it up and you can see it many, many, many miles. So away. if I was just walking so through a field, field. Like this. Oh, huh? if I was just walking through a field one night, I would just see this burning cross and I'd know to run. Well, what they do is they wrap it. They wrap it. Yeah. Well, get out of that field. You're right. They 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 wrap it in, in burlap bags, sacks, toe sacks. We used to call them. About that thick. You know, they've got that cross in there, and then and of course they soak it in kerosene, you know, except for a while. And then when they do the ceremony, they hit that, the whole thing burns. Yeah, they're protected. How many people did Indiana have? Out of like out of the five million. How many? Well, they didn't have five million in Indiana. There were five million. Yeah, out of, the, out of the five million. I don't know what the population did. I was, I was just a wild guess, and I have no way of knowing what the population of Indiana was in 1920 or even today. But I would say Indiana might have had two million people, two million people. But they had the most Klan members of any state, and not all people in Indiana were in the Klan, but they just had the most people in there. Now look at that. There's the Klan. 250,000 of them marched through the streets of Washington. 250,000. That's how powerful that they are. That is scary. That's the dome of the U.S. Capitol. And they marched right by him and they marched right by the White House. 200. And then they had a big rally at the Washington Monument, okay? 200, which is about a block from the White House. They had 250,000 people. That's how powerful. Powerful the clan is. Okay? That's crazy. That's scary. So, looking at all these things that I've just told you to a lot of people, looking at their newspapers in the 1920s and early in the 20s, there will be a new piece of technology where you can instantly find out what's going on all over the country. What's that? The radio. The radio. The radio. I'm going to show you some people listening to a radio in just a little bit, maybe tomorrow. But anyway, the radio. Uh, and now, you know, look, the first radio broadcast was from the station KDKA in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You have to write that down with you. KDKA, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, they, uh, uh, you know, it was just, oh, it was amazing. It was as amazing as your smartphones or whatever it is you have. What's the latest piece of technology? Smartphone? Uh, what's this thing you got on your wrist? Apple Watch. Apple Watch. 
What? Yeah, Is that the latest piece of technology? Can you talk on it? Yeah. No, oh, Ma. Yeah, can you say yeah? Yeah, okay. Well, the radio was the equivalent to that. People were amazed. Look, and that's in 1921. In 1910, 11 years before the first radio broadcast, if you'd come down here to the drugstore on Main Street, you fall. And I'm sure they had two or three drugstores in those days. And you'd walked in there and sat down and said, give me a Coca-Cola. You know, so they sat down there uh, and you'd just been talking to people there. And you said, you know, one of these days, we'll be fellas, we're going to be able to sit here right here in this drugstore and listen to a baseball game and get played in New York. What would they have done to you? Wow. They'd, have, they'd have packed you off to a rubber room where you couldn't help yourself. They'd lock the door and the way key. They said, this person's insane. How in the world could we sit in Oklahoma and listen to a baseball game in uh, New York? Guess what? They did, 11 years later. So the radio, the radio comes along. And if you're listening to your radio and you're reading your newspaper in the early 1920s, get this down, uh, you're, you're clearly worried. Something, something is not right in this country. Now get this down, people are on edge. People are expecting the worst. And all of this is coming out of World War I, this disappointment in World War I. And then in 1919, this is a little bit before, this is the year before the decade of the 20s officially begins. So in 1919, get this down, there was a police strike in Boston. Boston, where is Boston? Which state is Boston? In? Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Boston is the capital city of Massachusetts. The policemen there, get this down. The police were there asked for a pay raise. I want to tell you how cheap. I want to tell you how cheap the Boston City Council was. These policemen, here these guys going out and putting their life on the line to protect the city. They had to buy their own bullets. The city wouldn't even buy their own bullets. Plus they had to have a pay raise in nearly two years. And so they just said, we just want a pay raise. And the city said, no, you're not going to get a pay raise. And so the next day, out of fifteen hundred policemen, out of fifteen hundred policemen, eleven hundred and thirty, something like that called in sick. They didn't come to work. And get this down. The criminal ran amok. Okay. You know what amok means? A-M-O-K. Yeah, it's completely out of control. And what do Americans think, reading that in their newspapers if you follow up on what do they think is happening? A well, a riot, but even bigger than a riot. A communist what? Communist. The communist revolution. revolution is starting in America. And boy, Americans are worried. It looks like the beginning of the communist revolution here. And they're just praying that it won't anybody, won't any elected official stand up to those thugs and restore order. Well, enter into the picture this man, the governor of Massachusetts. Write him down. The governor of Massachusetts. He should have come up. Well, that's not the governor of Massachusetts. I got these out of order. Uh, this man, Calvin Coolidge. Write him down. There he is, Calvin Coolidge. He's the governor of Massachusetts. He's right there in Boston. Boston is the capital of Massachusetts. He's right in the capital city. And so here's what Calvin Coolidge did. He took charge. It looks like the country's going to hell in the handbasket and nobody will take it. He took charge. First thing he did is he declared martial law. Write that down. What is martial law? Let's spell it correctly. Martial law, M-A-R. It gives complete power to the government. What? It gives complete power to the government? Well, yes, in a sense it does, but who takes control of the city if you declare martial law? The, uh, the, the governor. governor. The governor? Huh? The governor, the governor of the state. The army. army. The army. We said that. I'm sorry. The army. Right? <coughs> the, army the, the Massachusetts National Guard. He declared martial law. He said, if you're still on the streets at 6 o'clock, what's going to happen to you? You're going to be shot. We catch you breaking into anybody's property. What's going to happen to you? You're going to be shot. That's martial law. Once in a while, we have a hurricane or something that destroys a major city, and that's when the crud comes out. You know, while everything's destroyed and people are distraught, they're going to steal, and the governor of the state will declare martial law. He'll send out. They did this in Moore, Oklahoma, a few years ago. Uh, before the tornado had gone back up in the clouds, you know, the, the local thugs were out stealing, tell, breaking into people's houses that were still standing. Stealing televisions. And the governor declared martial law. He sent the National Guard down there. You know, catch you out after a certain time, you got real problems. So that's the first thing Coolidge did. Second thing he did, get this down. He said to the policeman, if you're not back at work Monday, what? Don't come back to work. You're fired. Don't come back at all because you're fired. You don't have a job anymore. Okay. 
And guess what? Most of them came back, but some of them didn't, and he fired them. Okay? And his critics said, people criticized him, they said, look, these guys were just exercising their right to strike. Every American has the right to strike. And you, Calvin Coolidge, broke that strike. Did he break the strike? No. no. Yes, he did. They all came back to work, or most of them came back to work. He, you understand what I'm saying? He said, you either come back or you're fired. He didn't say, okay, we'll give you a pay raise. He said, you come back or you're fired. He, listen, are you with me? He broke the strike. The strike failed. And they criticized Coolidge. And I want you to write this down. Here was Coolidge's reply. And he's going to go on to be president of the United States. He makes a lot of speeches. But I'm going to tell you what. These are the most famous words that ever came out of his mouth. And I always associate that with Coolidge. He said, you know, you got a right to strike. Yeah. But there is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, anytime. In quote. What is we, we talked about a Supreme Court case. What does that remind you of? Uh Shink versus Shink. Excellent, madam. Advanced to the head of the class. What did the court say to Shink? You got the right to free speech, but, but if your speech presents a clear and present danger to the public. To the public, what? You can be arrested. It can be taken away. You can be arrested. And that's what Calvin Coolidge is saying here. Yeah, you got the right to strike until your strike presents a danger to society at large, and then your right can be taken away. You understand that? Yes? Yeah. See? Okay. All right? Well, the next year, 1920, we're going to talk all about this, but we'll just say this where I get this down. So what difference did all this make? In 1920, the next year... It was a presidential election year, and the Republicans nominated Warren Harding. And Warren Harding, get him down. He's going to be elected president in 1920. But they needed a vice presidential candidate, and there's a great fear in the country. I've tried to explain that to you at the beginning of the 20s. People are fearful that the Congress are going to take over. So for vice president, they're looking for someone who's a tough law and order guy. Who do they choose? Coolidge. Could, let me ask you this. Could you say, could you say, this is what I'm going to say to you. You did really good on the sheet thing. Could you say that the Boston police strike was Calvin Coolidge's San Juan Hill moment? Yes. Sure could. Teddy Roosevelt storms up San Juan Hill in 1898. 1900, he's nominated for pre vice president. He wins. Six months after he's sworn in, McKinley's assassinated. And who becomes president? Theodore Roosevelt. What put him in that position? San Juan Hill. Well, look at this. 1919 was the police strike. 1920, Coolidge is nominated for VP. He and Harding are elected in 19 1920. They're sworn in in 1921. Cooley, uh, excuse me, Harding dies in 1923. And who becomes president of the United States? What put him there? Uh, uh, Boston uh, police strike. That's exactly true. Boston police strike. Very, very same thing. And write this down about Coolidge. Write this down about Coolidge. He's the president for most of the 1920s. And we're going to talk in detail about this, but he becomes president, excuse me, he becomes president in 1923, and he'll be president until 1929. And it all starts with the Boston police strike. It all starts with the Boston police strike. That was his San Juan Hill moment. Everybody with me so far? Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, so the 20s is a great period of intoleration. The toleration means you will not tolerate, you will not tolerate anything different than you. You set the model. Nobody, if somebody disagrees with you, they might not be a real American. So minorities and Roman Catholics and socialists and communists and people who don't speak English, even those who speak with foreign accents, are going to be persecuted in the 20s. One great example of that was a man named... Uh, and you don't have to write this guy down. I'm just illustrating my point. 
again, back in Chicago, out there on the shores of Lake Superior, out there on the beach, there was an Italian-American named Frank Petroni, okay? Uh, his family, they were immigrants, but he was out on the beach sunning himself, and there were two guys down the beach having an argument. <laughs> politics, why well, something go to the beach? Let's go to the beach and argue politics, that's fine. Uh, but they're down there having an argument, and one of the guys in this argument just yelled out to that other guy. He said, what the hell with the United States? And when Frank Petroni heard that, it made him so mad. He, and by the way, he had his pistol. You always need that when you go to the beach. This sounds like today. He took his pistol out, and he walked down, he shot the guy and killed him for saying to hell with the United States. Do you have the right to say to hell with the United States? Yes. Should you be shot for that? No. What's that called, say to hell with the United States? You know, it's, it's, it's called free speech. Yeah. Well, guess what? He killed the guy. They took him to jail. I'm trying to show you the tensions and the atmosphere in the 1920s. They took Frank Petroni to jail. They had a trial. And how long did it take the jury to find Frank Petroni innocent? Ten seconds. How much? Ten seconds. Well, you're pretty close. It took him, took him two minutes. They walked in the jury room, and in two minutes they were back, and they said, not guilty. And the guy admitted to shooting the guy for saying, to hell with the United States. There was another. There was a socialist named Joseph Yudowski. And Joseph Yudowski, in an argument with somebody, uh, said that Lenin, remember the guy that started the Russian Revolution? Lenin, he said, was the most brilliant man that ever lived. And he was put it, well, regardless if he is or not, Joseph Yudowski or me or you have the right to say that if there's free speech in this country. People say, well, you know, we got free speech, sort of. No, you've got free speech. Saying you sort of got free speech is like saying I'm sort of pregnant. No, you either are or you aren't. That's the bottom line. Well, so, no, you are or you aren't. And you either have free speech or you don't. Fully realizing that if your speech causes harm to somebody, it can be restricted. But as long as it doesn't cause harm, you have free speech. And, and you can say that Lenin was the most brilliant man that ever lived. That's what Joseph Yanowski said. He was a socialist. That's already a strike against him. And then he praises Lenin, the leader of the Communist Revolution, right in the middle of a great red scare. He went to prison for six months for that. President Stone. Huh? So it's the President Stone. Yeah, well, <laughs> I guess they weren't near any rocks. But anyway, the point is, is that, uh, you know, free speech is going to be denied certain groups, certain groups in this in this country. Uh, and, and get these two guys down. I think this is the most famous case. Write this down. I think this is the most famous case of intolerance in the United States in the 1920s, anyway, in the 1920s. Uh, and these two people are Nicolo <clears throat> They're Italian immigrants. Here we go, immigrants. Nicolo Sacco and uh, Bartolomeo. And you don't have to do it. Just put Sacco and Banzetti. <clears throat> Bartolomeo uh, Banzetti. When you get that written down, everybody get them to take a break real quick. Quick, chop, chop. Oh, we're out of time. Up. Okay, have a seat. Let me do this real quick. I've got about three minutes. Give me three more minutes of your time. Well, in 1921, I think it was 1921, an armored car, you know what an armored car is. You see that the banks, they deliver money and they have guards. An armored car, got this down, was robbed in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts. And uh, there were two guards and they were both killed. Now everybody knows there are bad teachers they're bad doctors. They're doctors that if you let them, they'll kill you. Uh, there are lawyers who will take your money and say, we're going to win this case, and they lose your case, cost you money, and take it. So there are bad people in every profession, and there are bad cops. Everybody knows that. Uh, but most policemen, you know, uh, have a, you know uh, 
take the obligation to be a policeman because they want to serve and protect the community. That's how most people view the police. They are here to serve us. And again, you may have had a bad experience with a cop, uh, and uh, you know, don't let that. I would just say, don't let that paint your your experience with all all police. Most go in to serve the public. And when a policeman is killed, especially in the line of duty, there's usually national mourning. And there's quite a bit of anger, and people want somebody punished. Okay? Well, when this policeman was killed, or these two cops, well, I should call them cops, when these two police officers were killed up there in this armed car robbery, people wanted someone punished. Okay? And a lot of times when society is angry and they want someone punished, Instead of seeking justice, they seek revenge, and there and 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 there's a huge difference. Yes, what year was this? this was 21, I believe. Don't hold me to that. But I think it's 21. They want there's a, there's a huge difference between justice and revenge. And so anyway, these two men were prime targets to be accused for this crime. Number one, they were immigrants. Uh, number two, they barely spoke English. Number three, during the World War One, they had received their draft notice, and they'd ran, they'd gone to Mexico to uh, not uh, to to uh, avoid serving in the war. They were considered to be draft dodgers. And number four, they were anarchists. Okay, I mean, how many strikes did these guys have against them in 1920s America? And get this down, they're going to be arrested uh, and taken to jail, and then there's going to be a big sensational trial. The trial lasted seven weeks. All lasted seven weeks. They never traced the money to these guys. They never traced the weapon that killed the two guards to these guys. Did you say seven weeks? Seven weeks. You know, in this country, you are considered innocent. I hear people all the time say, I'm going to go to court, I'm going to get a lawyer and go to court and prove my medicine. Calm down, Jeff Rowe. You don't have to prove anything. If you're accused, I don't care how much you have. If you ever serve on a jury, the judge will tell you, I don't care what you've read in the paper, I don't care how much evidence you've seen. When that person, whoever it is, regardless, of, when they walk in the courtroom, you as the jury have to consider them what? Yes, Innocent. And for what? The state of Oklahoma. Really in our case, the state of Oklahoma proves them guilty. In this case, it was just the reverse. There was a presumption of guilt. They were presumed to be guilty by the jury, the judge, by the press, because society wanted someone to punish. Right in the middle of the trial, you know, when, if you're ever on a jury, the first thing the jury does, 12 members, the first thing they do is they go in the room and they pick one of themselves as the four person. The person that kind of runs the jury, conducts votes of the jury. And uh, right in the middle of the trial, there was a newspaper man covering the trial. And, the jury was coming back into the courtroom, and the jury foreman was at the last one through. And there was a newspaper man sitting there, and he said to the jury foreman, this is the guy running the jury, he said to the jury foreman, he said, you know, I've been listening to this case for three or four weeks, and he said, you know, I think those two guys may be innocent. And the jury foreman looked at him and said, well, damn it, they ought to hang anyway. In other words, even if they're not guilty, here's our chance to get rid of these immigrants. We're going to kill them. And so for seven weeks, you know, how long do you reckon it would take if you were sitting on a, if you were called a jury duty down here in McIntosh County, for seven weeks, all day long, you listen to testimony from 75 witnesses, and then you had to go in a room and sort all that out and come to a verdict. How long do you think it would take you to sort through seven weeks of testimony? At least a day. Uh, oh, my gosh. Well, that would be a, that would be a world record. Uh, weeks, probably. How long did it take them? Two Two minutes. Two hours. Two hours they came back. That proves their minds were made up before they heard. Two hours. Well, it almost proves it. Two hours. And uh, what was the verdict? Guilty. Guilty. Mark Kay and Brashears come to the office. And Sackle and Vanzetti were put to death in the electric chair. It's a horrible death. They shave the back of your head and put a metal piece there. They shave your ankles and put a metal piece there. And then they hit a switch and send electricity through your body. And sometimes it doesn't kill you at first, and they have to do it again and again. Usually the eyeballs pop out when that happens. It's a terrible way to die. And that's how they, that's how Psycho and Benzetti died. And most scholars who have looked at this case, you know, this case that happened 90 years ago, 
100, well, 101 years ago, those scholars that looked at this case believe that these men were not killed for a crime they committed. They were killed because of who they were. They happened to be in the wrong place in the wrong decade. This was a great period of toleration. I don't want you to think that everything in the 1920s is evil and wrong, but there are a lot of problems coming out of World War I. Look at the problems we're having coming out of this pandemic. You know, they had just come out of the Spanish flu. Look at, look at the problems we're having. We have people that, don't, that, that, that are in the neighborhood looking for their friend's house, and they knock on the door, and the guy opens the door and shoots them, or they park in their own parking lot. You know, I think that's because we have been under such tension in this country due to this pandemic, and I'm not looking for an excuse. I'm not making excuses, but I think we can relate in a lot of ways to the 1920s. Well, scurry on to your next slide. I think it's technology. Well, and you know what? You're right. This artificial intelligence. It's, you know, but but, but technology has been around as long as the human race. It's a monetize. It's a monetizing violence. We just have yeah. Well, we just have to adjust. Because I don't think that we value human life anymore. We well, just think of it as uh, I think that the I mean, like, I'm not even trying to like, I play video games all the time, but like, we're like used to like seeing Call of Duty and all that. I, I just like, I wouldn't know shoot something that don't have my door. But I feel like people have. Like, I mean, I didn't get sketched out. Even, but no, but even nowadays, though, like, even like. Even like all my, you know, on internet. Okay, Ari. What, Dylan? You take forever. Whatever name. You're taking that so you can study for the semester. No, but. Okay. Give it to me. Give it to me. Hey, anybody want some cats? Hey, you want me to end this? Uh, you want me to end that? Is that all? Yeah. Yeah, if you don't mind. What? Uh,